you very much. Um, this has come out of work that I did with Ray Rivers, who's at Imperial with me, and Carl Nappett, um, looking at the Aegean. Um, because of the work we did there, we got very interested in spatial models in general, and Ray and I not having access to uh, the interesting archaeological data that many of you are talking about, <laughs> went back to an old uh, project, and we had a look at uh, whether with a modern viewpoint in terms of the uncertainty, whether we could revisit some work of Rillin Wilson that's quite well known. So uh, the focus originally of this project was not so much the agglomeration, the um, interesting questions about uh, city-states or, or settlements in general, but was the role of uncertainty in modeling. When we did our work with Carl in the Aegean, yeah, how could we be certain that we had the right answer. And we've had many speakers, for instance, in the last, highlighting worries people have about modeling. You know, there are lots of choices. What parameter do I choose? Or, I mean, the Carcassonne uh, tiles in the last talk, very nice example. How do you deal with incomplete data? Now, I personally think there are lots of solutions out there. Archaeology has particular challenges, but they're not, doesn't mean that we give up on modeling. I think you just have to work harder. And this is our sort of attempt to begin to show how you could um, include uncertainty. But the most important thing, uh, whoops, that's gone on, one too many. Oh, well, that's, uh, the most important thing is to try and give some sort of measurement of uncertainty. And that's what we try to do here. So what are the models I'm talking about? Well, these are spatial models. So we've got some sort of set of inputs, which for us will just be the sites. Um, and we're going to try and link those together uh, with distances. So all we're going to include here is geography. So all those other factors we're not going to include. We're going to see how far you can go just with geography. And the outputs here will be some sort of flows or interaction strengths um, between the various sites that you have. And what is the... Um, area we're looking at, well this is the study of Rill and Wilson from 1987 and 1991, and they focused on 109 sites from around about the 8th century BC in central Greece, and the, uh, of course what they're looking for is that all of these sites, which they treated as relatively, uh, well, all identical or all equally likely centres for a future development, their question was to try and identify which sites would emerge purely because of geography uh, in the long run as the dominant site in their region. Okay. Um, now, they, their, their uh, analysis is, in many ways, very straightforward, very simple. So they're putting very little information in, and we'll see where we get to. If you need more, that's great. You have to go away and do more hard work. But if this is already telling you something interesting, then that's interesting. They just use straight line distances between the different sites. Uh, and they use what Ray calls the retail archaeology model because it came out of actually real studies of modern uh, retail economics. Literally, this model was used commercially uh, by, I think, Alan Wilson and others to help supermarkets locate future uh, stores. So in one sense, this is a tried and tested model with real humans, whether or not, you know, uh, it's particularly relevant here, I don't know, but this is what you can uh, take. It's a very simple model, and it's been studied in other archaeological contexts. Now, the answer, in a sense, is very obvious uh, here. Which, which of the sites will emerge to dominate the region? Well, we know the answer. It's uh, just pick four of the major ones, the Athens, Corinth, Argos, and Thebes. And that's what I will focus on. But what particularly attracted our attention was in the original paper, there was no quantitative measure of uncertainty. So we were trying to take this uh, study, and it's not that we don't think it's a bad study, we just wondered whether, yeah, how certain could you be that Thebes does emerge as the dominant site up in the ocean? Uh, how certain can you be that Athens, just because of geography, would always have emerged? There wasn't any measure of that. So we set out to try and do that. 
Now, the way that Rill and Wilson identify their sites, they, their dominant sites, there's something that they call terminal sites. And in their paper, you get a, a picture a bit like this. Not exactly a network, but pretty much most sites have a single line to their neighboring big site. And you can see just pictorially that it picks out certainly the four major sites in this case and a few other regional sites like uh, Chalkis at the top. Um, and that's great. But this is the sort of answer you would get uh, in their paper. So our question was, uh, how can we measure uncertainty? And can we do this for the Rill and Wilson model? So um, our approach was to take a set of open source data. Well, the data wasn't open source at the time, but I digitized one of their figures. So it's now open source. And we wanted to look at some variations. There is no way that we know exactly how far different uh, sites were. You could do all the GIS in the world, and you, we still know that, of course, that only captures some aspects of uh, the geology or the, sorry, the uh, geography at the time. So yeah, let's not worry too much about it, but let's try a few different variations. If any result depends crucially on details like this, then we'd be worried. But if you keep getting the same results coming out, you say, OK, 5 10%, 15% variation in the distances. Yeah, we can live with that. That's the sort of error I have expect. Likewise, when I come on to uh, look at the model, I'll highlight the fact that the model itself has uh, some very um, some choices you can make. So I'll look at that. So as I mentioned, <laughs> I digitized the distances <coughs> by hand. This is the original figure. I literally just took the figure, took a screenshot. Uh, that's all online. Um, the most interesting part uh, for us, and this is, I think, one of only two or three equations we're going to show, but we don't need to pay much attention to them. This is the retail um, archaeology model that I mentioned at the beginning. This is what we actually use. So you put the site sizes in. They're all equal here. This is the, um, the later site size, if you like, the emergent size. This is an output from the model. These are the flows. As I said, all spatial models give you in fact, the flows tell you the effective size later. And this whole model just runs around and finds uh, the best possible solution, uh, given this very limited amount of information. And the one place where distance, if you like geography, comes in um, is here. So this, what I call the um, distance to cost function, this potential here, is some sort of function you have to tell me, you have to give it to me. Typically, all your distances, so this is the distance between two sites, I and J, are scaled relative to one parameter, uh, which I call big D, the distance scale. So if you're interested in working on a 10 kilometer scale, so that's 10 kilometers. If it's 100 kilometers, 100. So for instance, in the work I've done in the Aegean, the car, you know, 10 kilometers might be a good scale for sort of rowing in the early Bronze Age, but maybe when you've got sail, 100 kilometers is roughly right. I'll come back to the, that in a little bit. The form of the distance function, though, this function of cost the distance, that's the thing that there's a wide amount of choice in. Uh, although there's a typical distance scale, which is the big D parameter in the problem, you can choose different shapes. You imagine that the further you go, the less likely you are to have flow between two sites, the costs get higher. So that this is going to suppress, you want these functions to fall away as you get to larger and larger distances. But the precise shape, of course we don't know. We don't know whether the cost is true, you know, our time to, to make the journey, whether it's got something to do with a social or political cost. A lot of that information is lost. You could add that in if you have it. Uh, but let's suppose we don't have it. You would want some general shape looking like this. But we don't know exactly what shape. So the, what we did, we took several different uh, examples. Exponential form is the one that Rill and Wilson used. Ah, oh, this is a bit of a disaster. I have... This is an early version of my talk. Um, so this has finished. 
Oops. I'm afraid I've copied the wrong version. Um, let's see if I've got. Uh, I've gone back to the beginning. Yes, but I, I've got a feeling that's an earlier version. Let me, let me see if I can just find the conclusions because I'm nearly, nearly finished as it is. Ah, I haven't got the final slides. Um, Okay, let, let me, I can show you the results. This is the main result from our, our shift F5. Right. So what do we do at the end of this? Well, we managed to end up with, this is uh, two sets of results. The colored ones ignore. Let's look at the gray, the gray one. So Rill and Wilson came up with very definite results. They found that these four sites continually appeared again and again and again, whatever they did, at least according to the paper. We've now introduced more variation. And what you can see from these dark sites is that when you've asked for eight dominant sites in your region, emerging purely because of geography, these are the sorts of sites you get. You don't get a single site, you get a set of sites. So for instance, down here is Argos, uh, number 101, but we found two or three other sites would pick up in the same area, and these regions are typically about 10, 10 kilometers wide. The exception was Athens, at least when we we're working at Arlo, Athens continually turned up again and again and again as a unique answer. So when you're asking, you know, how certain can you be, we could be pretty certain that actually geography, according to this uh, model, is almost always going to uh, pick Athens as a dominant side. Whereas Thebes, the uh, question I put in the title up here, you're much less certain. Okay, it'll be, if not Thebes, it'll be a village here within about 10, 5 kilometers of it. And there's Corinth over there. So that if you imagine a sort of process of agglomeration where certain sites are slowly growing and becoming more dominant, if you looked at an era when you had eight sites, the grey circles, um, then you could see the Athens Argos current emerging as part of that. Another conclusion, though, was that if you then pushed it on and said, What if this model picked out three sites? then you do get another answer. You still find Athens emerging con uh, consistently. Now, feeds it's much less clear that the circle is bigger, there are more sites we keep uh, finding. But there's a real problem down here, and that Corinth and Athens. Uh, sorry, Corinth and Argos, you know, neither of them are picked out as the dominant site. So if this model is telling us anything, either geography is working in some cases, working up to an error of, say, 10, 15 kilometers up here, but failing down here, something else is needed, or perhaps what happens is you agglomerate it into eight or so dominant sites, and then different processes other than uh, geography. Uh, were needed to understand what happened later. So in this case, these two cities remained uh, dominant powers. Okay, so that'll uh, do, do me for now. So the, the conclusions well, elsewhere. Um, the conclusions we reached were that uh, you need to include uncertainty uh, whenever you do modeling, and we've shown various ways you could do it in this case. And that for this particular example, geography can go a long way to explaining uh, some of the patterns we see uh, and where you find uh, a failure in our very, very simple model. That's when we suggest you need to go away and start adding in more, either using agent-based models or a more sophisticated model. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the...